Welcome, dun, 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 drum roll, please, to the first episode of Rail Talk. Rail Talk is sponsored, by the way, by Facing Tipton, TaylorMade, and the Green Group. I'm Joe Bianca. I'm an ownership advisor for West Point Thoroughbreds. And John, I don't think I've seen you in person since we left the old show, but God, have we spoken a lot. I just like, it's enough already. This has been a, a, a lifetime in the making, uh, Joe Bianca. I'm Jonathan Green, General Manager of DJ Stable, and I'm just so excited to be back on the podcast. My two-year banishment has been released. Churchill Downs is allowing me to come back on, and uh, thus was born Rail Talk. Rail Talk is blessed to be sponsored by several industry leaders, including the Green Group. You might have heard of them once or twice, and Johnny Green over here is a little familiar with them. Uh, they have over 500 clients in the horse business, and if you're paying too much in taxes, give them a call. They're an expert in this field in particular. Len Green is the patriarch of the Green family and really the godfather of, of horse tax season, if, you, if I'd say so myself, John. He doesn't need to be doing this, but he loves his work. He loves being in the horse business. He loves saving you money. The Green Group, check him out at greenco.com. Listen, if there were any doubt that John and I were meant to be back on the air at this particular time, at this particular place in racing's history, let there be no further doubt. After this week, actually just a couple of days ago, Monday, it was announced that Bob Baffert's suspension by Churchill Downs would be extended through the end of 2024. Now, if you remember, he was indefinitely suspended by Churchill Downs after the whole drama with Medina Spirit failing the test and eventually getting DQ'd from the Derby. They have reserved the right to extend his suspension with any you know, any pretext whatsoever. They're a private company. They can do this if they, if they feel like it. And I'm just going to read a quote and then we'll get John's reaction and I'll, I'll, we'll come back to me. The statement from Churchill reads, Mr. Baffert continues to peddle a false narrative concerning the failed drug test of Medina Spirit at the 147th Kentucky Derby, from which his horse was disqualified by the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission in accordance with Kentucky law and regulations. Prior to that race, Mr. Baffert signed an agreement with Churchill Downs, which stated that he was responsible for understanding the rules of, Kentucky, of racing in Kentucky and that he would abide by them. The results of the test clearly show he did not comply, and his ongoing conduct reveals his continued disregard for the rules and regulations that ensure horse and jockey safety as well as the integrity and fairness of the races conducted at our facilities it goes on a little bit but that's that's the crux of it right there and I think, you know john i think i want to surprise some people with where i stand on this but i'm curious to, to, to hear your initial reaction from this statement by churchill joe i think i'm gonna surprise some people as well because it, you know i've been very outspoken about uh how i feel about bob baffert as a trainer and and as an industry um leader and and somebody who promotes the industry um but you know at this stage of the game looking at it as a you know as as, as facts come in and and situations that, that that are laid out um i really don't think this is fair i really think that when when baffert and his attorneys came in and said okay what's our punishment Churchill Downs came in and said, you have a two-year banishment. Two years, you're not going to be able to race here. And basically, they, you know, for all intents and purposes, Baffert and his team signed off on that, saying, all right, we're not happy about this, but we're going to take the two-year suspension. And at the end of two years, we're going to come back and we're going to be able to race again. And, and basically, what Churchill Downs said was, not so fast. You know, we don't like the fact that whatever the reason is. I mean, they're, 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 you know, it's a private place, so they can, they can say, we don't want to have trainers with alliteration in their name come in. And that's why Bob Baffert's not racing here. It, it doesn't really matter what the, what the reasoning is. But from a fairness standpoint, the guy served his time. They gave him a two-year sentence. They basically said, we're giving you two years. If they had said, we're giving you five years, and he had served the five years, then he should be able to come back, again, provided that he doesn't try to sue them or, or, you know, or throw their, their name in the mud and, and things like that. But the bottom line for me is that they gave him a sentence. He, uh, you know, obligated by it, didn't, didn't uh, fight it for all intents and purposes, except in the court of public appeal. And now Churchill Downs is coming back and saying, ah, we think that you're peddling a false narrative, which is, I think, one of the greatest, you know, terms ever, peddling a false narrative. It was only, it was, it's only too many letters. Otherwise, we'd name a horse that. That's how, that's how <laughs> in love I am with that, yeah. with that statement. But I really think this goes back to Churchill Downs being embarrassed. Churchill Downs coming, you know, a lot of things coming into Churchill Downs um, as far back as, you know, Medina Spirit and Gamine in the Oaks. And basically, Bafford, you know, through these drug tests, you know, quote unquote, like tainted those 
races. And those yeah. were those were absolutely sacred races by yeah. Churchill Downs and by the industry. So for him to do that and then come in and say, well, and blame a cancer culture and say, well, you know, it wasn't really me. It was that you guys are all looking for a villain and, and that's me. So I, I have more to go, but let's 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 continue to talk about it. Yeah, no, I I, I mean that's kind of where I'm at. And thank you for correcting me. But by the way, it was in, initially an indefinite suspension, and then it was through the end of twenty of 2023. So it became a, or 2022. It became a two year suspension. He couldn't participate in the 22 or 23 derbies. Anyway, bottom line is there has been no new information since the Medina, since the Medina Spirit disqualification. And not, it's not that I disagree with their quote. I think Bob Baffert, especially in the in the immediate aftermath, kind of made a fool of himself by making all these excuses for why the horse tested positive and never really accepting full responsibility for it. But that happened two years ago. And his as far as I know, his horses have not tested positive for anything major in the two years since. And so I'd say this is someone that when the Medina Spirit you know, uh, controversy came out. I was in favor of an indefinite suspension to Bob Baffert. Come back when we want you back. But now that he hasn't been suspended like that and he hasn't had any major positives recently and he's kept a relatively low profile and he's not bashing tracks and, and the sport in the media, I don't see how, what the grounds are for the suspension. And I, yeah, I think it's going to end up being an unfortunate uh, like byproduct of this is the 2024 Derby again is going to be about Bob Baffert. There were a lot of stories about a guy who didn't have any horses in this year's or last year's Derby. And I think that's going to continue now for another year. At the end of the day, I believe John, that you're right. They, they got embarrassed. They, the, the Kentucky Derby is their brand and excuse my language, but don't fuck with a company's brand. Like they're, they're, the way they make their money, they do not want you coming anywhere close to that with a, with a whiff of breaking the rules or cheating or, even after getting a positive test, then excuse making. They didn't want it then. They don't want it now. But there has been no new information. I think he should be allowed to race, John. Yeah, and, and you can't, you know, people have been talking about two things that, that, number one, Churchill Downs is using this to make people look the other way with regard to all of the horses that have died on the racetrack of late and the fact they had to cancel the last week of, of racing and, and run it at Ellis Park. You know, it's almost like, don't look over here. Don't look behind the curtain. Look over there. Um, I don't really believe that that's why. I don't think that that's the reason. There's also a sentiment out there that says, well, because Baffert has – you know, had so many of his horses have tested positive over the years and have died in his care, um, you know, that, that there's a residual effect. And that's why Churchill Downs is now picking this moment um, to, to basically penalize him for all of his, uh, you know, previous infractions. I, I don't believe that either. I really think that it comes down to two bullies got into a fight and neither one of them are yielding. Um, at this point, Churchill Downs is going to win in this venue. Bob Baffert's going to win at other venues because he won the Preakness and he's got good horses. And they will continue to have this kind of pissing match until uh, until they can finally come together. Joe, the one thing, though, that I'm really surprised about is, you know, Baffert's paying for the top attorneys that are out there to help represent him. Don't you think that at some point in time, his attorney, his legal counsel would have gone back to Churchill Downs and say, hey, we're starting to ramp up towards the end of this penalty period. Um, maybe we should all come together and have a press conference or maybe we should have a joint press release or at the very least, make sure that we're OK in your eyes, that we haven't done anything in your eyes to embarrass ourselves or embarrass you. And therefore, once July 1st comes around, I'm going to be able to start racing at Churchill Downs owned racetracks. I am shocked and amazed that they didn't do that to try to find out exactly what the situations they seem, they being Baffert's team, seems to be as as floored about this as as the general public is. I was surprised you took that stance, quite frankly. Yeah, no, I mean, if he had if there was like another high profile drug positive or something like that, you know, or yeah. He had got he had continued railing in the media about Churchill Downs. Then I would say, yeah, like he, he made his own bed. But right. in this case, like there's nothing he's done since the, the Medina Spirit right. disqualification to warrant that. Yeah. yeah, that's that was exactly my feeling as well. At this time, we are so honored to welcome the first guest on Rail Talk. She's a pretty damn good broadcaster herself. She's an award-winning writer, thoroughbred breeder and owner. She's the track analyst at Tampa Bay Downs and host of the Breeders' Cup Future Stars Friday forecast. That's a mouthful. <laughs> Ren Carruthers, thank you so much for coming on. Oh my gosh, are you kidding? Honor to have me. You know, it's an honor to be your first guest on this flagship show. Uh, how amazing it is to you know be part of this. 
We're so stoked to have you. And, and John, you went on Ren's show so far. I'm guessing we don't run quite as tight a ship as Ren's show, but you can tell me otherwise. Well, the, the nice thing about it is that, that Ren basically just says to you, just talk. And she didn't have a mute button for me. So we did one show that was an hour and a half. And the second show was like two hours, um, if I remember correctly. Yeah, the first time. And you still hold the record for the longest Future Stars forecast at two hours and change. Yeah. That is not a surprise to anyone <laughs> listening to this podcast. Absolutely. No, but it's always been exciting and fun. And that's why, um, you know, when Joe and I were putting the show together, we said, there's only one show that we want to be on to make this announcement. And unfortunately, Steve Bick was in Italy. So then we went to Ren's show and, and made the announcement on Ren's show. And, and we've just been flooded, flooded with, uh, you know, with absolutely texts and tweets and, and responses. Most of them are good. Um, some of them are like, you know, keep, stay away from Ren. You're, you're tainting her show. But otherwise... <laughs> Otherwise, it's been, you know, it's been a lot of fun, but we couldn't think of anyone better than Aww. you to, to come on and, and be a part of this first show. Well, as I told you before, it bears repeating for your audience. The only thing that I feel uh, a little bit seen by is the fact that I lack Eclipse Awards and I lack a beard, but I do bring the fun. <laughs> If we if we have you enough times on the show, I think one of those two things will happen. I can't I can't guarantee which one. And when you were saying that John's appearance was two and two and a half hours, I thought that you were going to say that he spoke for two two and a half hours straight, which I also would not be surprised by. Yeah, yeah. As Pretty you much. Can see it, right it was here. the first question. Ren was like, "Hey, how you doing today?" And then I just went on for two hours. <laughs> Well, back in 1982, we won this. Uh, and John is the king of backhanded compliments, as you can see, uh, right? That's one of his, his strong suits. Uh, but I must tell you that the, the that Rail Talk is brought to you by Facing Tipton. And we're so stoked to bring Facing Tipton on as a sponsor. Obviously, one of the leading auction houses in the world. And as luck would have it, they got a big sale coming up next week. Next Tuesday, July 11th, is the Facing Tipton July yearling sale. The July sale is ranked number one by percentage of stakes winners, percentage of stakes horses, and percentage of two-year-old winners. So to me, that spells out the best value yearling sale in the calendar. I was going to ask this question to John, but now someone better is here to talk about it. <laughs> Ren, can you tell us a little bit how, how the, what the approach is like for owners and breeders kind of at, at these early stages of the, of the yearling season and particularly at the July sale? Well, I think it gets to, to be, you, you've got people of, of two minds. You have the people who are trying to get a horse in early at a lower cost than what they'll have to pay for a two-year-old. Uh, but then you also have people who are looking at yearlings that they can turn around, put in some work themselves, some elbow grease, so to speak, and then go ahead and pin hook them uh, come the two-year-old sale. So I, I think it's of two minds. I personally don't have the bankroll to go buy any of these horses. So I look at it uh, in, in two different manners. I look at it as, okay, well, what what would I do? Who are maybe some of the horses I should be looking forward uh, to as a handicapper going forward? Maybe I want to keep tabs on, see who, you know, who buys them. Um, but also I kind of like telling people like John who have staples, hey, maybe you should look at this horse. <laughs> Yeah, um, it, it's it's really fun for me. There's a lot of I feel uh, the idea of putting a puzzle together and seeing where those pieces do ultimately fit. Yeah, no. And, and, and one of the fun parts yeah, of, of this show is, is of this show. Uh, one of the fun parts of this sale is the new sire showcase angle. Yes. Of it. Um, and and there's you know there's like ten or eleven new sires and um, including game winner and improbable and tis the law and war of will. Were there any new sires that uh, that piqued your interest or that you were like, hey, this is a great example of who I would you know put together as far as a mating goes for for any of those that I mentioned or, or <laughs> one that I didn't mention. Well, I, I mean, honestly, I, I think they all have some uh, elements they're bringing to the table that are very attractive. For example, the game winner, of course, it's attractive when you have a horse who was able to win the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. And also, if anybody follows me, they know that I'm a huge, like, goofy fan of Family 1X. And game winner is part of that family. So I do love that he brings that to the table with that deep, deep pedigree himself as a sire. War of Will, you got to love the war fronts. So I'm excited to see what he will do uh, with his... His progeny, especially with that versatility that he showed on track himself. Uh, we have a horse that's already off and running with some of his babies, talking about Omaha Beach. That horse is very exciting. I think Volatile is exciting as well. Um, there's a horse in particular that I'm kind of keen on uh, there in the book. Uh, he has many progeny in. And I it really is tough. I mean, you have so many good horses. You have authentic in the, in the mix. Uh, so improbable. Um, it, it's just really a matter of, for me, I look, I'm looking more at the female families and how they fit with these respective sires. 
Yeah, no, that, that's always that's always intriguing, especially this early in the season to see what how the market reacts to those first crop sizes as well. So, all right, we're already getting our money's worth out of Ren. So this is that's that's been great living up to the Pettikeek nickname. Um, so, <laughs> oh, so we, well, on that note, I would be remiss if I didn't also mention in terms of those uh, sires, you know, who are going to be trying to make a name for themselves. We also have Echo Town. He's the half brother by Spice Town, who was a champion sprinter. Uh, they're standing at Coolmore. Uh, you know, the half brother to Echo Zulu. It's pretty exciting as well, considering also how precocious she was herself. Yep. Very excited to see him, his foals in action. And it's, it's very interesting to always see the early market reaction to those first yearlings from those sires that you guys mentioned and, and a few others as well. 370 hips are cataloged for the FASIC tipped in July sale, which is next Tuesday. Bidding, bidding begins at 10 a.m. Let's talk a little racing, guys. There is a little bit of racing left before Saratoga, believe it or not. As much as everybody's already moved on, Belmont Park will have a pretty darn good card this Saturday with four graded stakes, including a pair of grade ones, the Belmont Oaks and the Belmont Derby. Johnny, Johnny Bananas, I think we're actually going to see you at the track on Saturday. I didn't think you actually made it out here. (laughs) You know, I, there, there's going to be, uh, you know, probably some kind of uh, autograph session slash uh, book signing at, at some point, um, you know, for, for some of this. Uh, but certainly, uh, yeah, we will be making uh, an appearance. We went to Woodbine last week um, to watch Wonder Wheel, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but now we have, you know, back to back grade ones coming up this weekend in the Belmont Oaks and the and the Belmont Derby. And and I, for one, you know, I'm. You're going to be surprised. I'm a little biased as far as who I think is going to win, um, you know, in, in these races. Go figure. Um, but I would love to hear Ren's point of view, especially with regard to maybe some of these Euro horses that are coming in for the first time. Because this is, you know, this mile and a quarter distance is an impossible distance for a lot of horses. Well, it can be. But as you just spoke to the Europeans, I mean, one of my favorite quotes in all of racing is from uh, Federico Tessio, in which he speaks about how the Epsom Derby, the, the, the breed is basically, I'm not going to quote it uh, because I don't want to butcher it, but basically the quote can be. And, and, and he spoke Italian too. So you'd have to do it in a completely different language. <laughs> yeah. I, I, that would, that would be an ultimate fail for me, but uh, <laughs> he, he basically speaks about how the thoroughbred, what, what defines a thoroughbred is that winning post of the Epsom Derby. So when you think of that, and now you do think of where the breed kind of is in terms of how we race here, there is a big disparity, obviously, but um, the European breeding is, is solid. And I especially, if you want to get into speaking about the uh, specific horses, we can do that. But I first off the top want to say two things. One, it's really hard, obviously, when you have a friend who has horses in that, of course, I'm going to be rooting for your horses. Also, it's kind of fun that I don't know if you even realize this, but you kind of have like a uh, uh, an, an insect double. <laughs> you've got Papilio who's a butterfly and you've got Web Slinger who's a spider. Well, you know, I didn't realize that. That's <laughs> awesome. Wow. <laughs> Did you well, know you what Papilio meant, John? Did you know I what Papilio meant? Papilio meant, meant, meant butterfly, but I didn't really put okay. together the connection of the butterfly and the, and the spider, in, again, in, in different languages. So, again, Ren Carruthers not only, uh, you know, brings our game up, but, but yeah. is teaching us something as well. That, that's what I try to do. You know, I, I, I try to look at things that nobody has looked at because they don't care. <laughs> well, we all specialize in that kind of knowledge over here, so that's why you're fitting in seamlessly. <laughs> But one thing I, I noticed, I did notice about these races is I don't know that there is as much European participation as I would have pre- liked or predicted or, you know, thought based on the early runnings of these races. I mean, we got two in each race, only one off of the, the plane in the uh, in the Belmont Derby, two in the Oaks. I wonder why that is. I mean, with the with the Colts, I feel like we just had the, the King Edward stake at Ascot. We had the mm-hmm. Irish Derby. Yeah. Do we think it's like not on a great part of the calendar? Because it's interesting that that Belmont and Naira have brought the uh, Jockey Club Derby and the Jockey Club Oaks to fruition recently in October. I'm thinking maybe that's a little bit more of a, a, a tradition or a, a re- logical launching pad to the Breeders' Cup than this race where you already got these classics going on in Europe. And it doesn't necessarily make sense to ship over and then ship back. What do you guys think? Well, I'm going to leave that, that one. Just, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, let, go ahead. Let, let no, no, no. <laughs> I was going to leave that to you, John, because, I mean, you, you're somebody who has this experience of shipping your horses back and forth. And the in not only how that affects them physically, but also from just travel fatigue, period, uh, you know, going back and forth across the pond there. 
Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, I think there's only a, a handful of euros that are coming over for these races. Um, number one, because in the past, these races were actually a million dollars, and they've slowly been go- going down in in in, in purse monies. Um, not that seven fifty for the for the Derby <laughs> and half a million for the, for the Oaks isn't good money. It's very good money. But when you compare it to some of the other um, you know some of the other races now that are in the states, even some of the allowance races that are you know at six figures in, in one hundred fifty thousand dollars at some of these racetracks, um, it, you know they're not going to come necessarily for that. The other thing is at the timing of it, Joe, I think you're exactly right. There are bigger races um, that mean more in Europe for a lot of these horses. And, and number three, they're just scared to death about running against us, you know, <laughs> running against Papilio right. and, and Web Slinger. And I don't, I don't blame them for that. Um, but it, but I, I, I will say that, you know, we, we have purchased horses that have come overseas. We have watched um, to see the way that a lot of the successful guys do it, like whether it's Klarovich or um, Peter Brandt uh, and, you know, and, and, and the likes, um, Charlie Appleby. And, and what I've noticed is that they have success in two different ways. Number one is if they – ship here and they run like immediately or if they ship here they get acclimated and then six months later they run here it's really not it's to your disadvantage almost if you ship here and you train for like six or eight weeks and then try to run Um, i don't know why that is i don't know if there's if there's some kind of a hangover effect or a travel effect that 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 you know that that hangs over these horses when they come over. But if you watch Chad Brown, who I think is the, the expert at this, has been doing it the longest, um, and Ren, back me up if, I, if, I, if I'm correct on this, you know, Chad brings these horses over and they run immediately, almost immediately off the plane. Yeah, I, he's, he's got them primed and ready to roll, so... So, so they're, they're coming off the plane. They're, you know, they're, they're taking off their, their, their little, uh, you know, sleep neck pillows and, and, and their little footy pajamas and everything. And they're ready to go. Um, and I think that, that there is one horse coming in for the Belmont Derby that's doing that. Um, the Foxes that's coming in that ran, you know, just <laughs> three or four weeks ago. And, yeah. and pretty much everybody else has been here at stateside yeah. or, or came here um, and ran a couple of times. So I, I think they're kind of falling into what those, those two camps, but, um, I'd be interested to see just how, uh, how these races continue to progress. If the purses continue to go down because they can still go down and still be considered a grade one caliber race. Um, or if they shift it a little bit and, and instead of making it the last weekend of, of Belmont, um, uh, maybe they make it the, uh, the, the first weekend of, of the fall meet. Yeah, or maybe earlier in the spring instead of the Edgewood or the American Turf or whatever. I just got this picture in my head of the horse walking off of the plane through the airport. I hope they don't make them take their shoes off because that's going to take a long time. Huh? Am I right? <laughs> you think they, they have clear or they have TSA pre or something? <laughs> uh, you know, just looking at the Belmont Derby, it reminds me of how I let uh, Web Slinger beat me at 22 to 1, even oh though he was John's gosh. horse. And Ren, like, I assume you... you, you you know, you 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 de- tend to like favor some of your friends' horses, as you I said did. earlier. Did you use Web Slinger that well, day? Well, I'm. Oh, uh, which okay, which one of us wins the Audubon, or are you talking about Churchill the, again? The American Turf on Derby Day. Yeah. Okay. So here's here's the problem. I didn't even bet that this day. This is a no, I, by the way. This is a no with an excuse. <laughs> Do you not know the story? Okay, here's the quick story because I don't know how long we can take this. So I was actually at Churchill. I was working. Uh, I was hosting a Q&A session with uh, Hall of Fame jockeys, okay? And we were just wrapping up and this race was going off. And I had totally forgotten that uh, that Web Slinger was running. And I'm watching the race play out. And suddenly I see the DJ stable colors. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's Web Slinger. That's right. He's going to win. He's going to win crosses the wire and I'm all excited. And then John calls, he's like, Ren, (laughs) he's like, that's our 25th hundredth win. You got to go get the trophy. So here I am in this giant headpiece, this giant poofy dress, and I'm in heels and I'm running from the Derby Museum, trying desperately to get to the winner's circle, but I didn't have the proper credentials even when I finally got there. And so I couldn't go. (laughs) <laughs> I tried. So, I tried. So for the, the win photo, we have one without Ren and one that we superimposed, yeah. like a cardboard <laughs> cutout of Ren with like sweat pouring down yeah. and the poofy dress and everything. Yeah, and, exactly. and she's there almost holding the trophy. She's, I she's tried, though. There. That, yeah. that yeah. was an effort. So you could say it was a heartbreaker from that standpoint. Absolutely. The hustle is on 100,000. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> exactly. For sure. exactly. Yeah, but, for me, Joe, it was just like, that horse knocked me out. That horse knocked me out of like every pick four or pick five. And I was like, yo. Those are John Silks. And I have a, I have a shirt. I have a Wonder Wheel and a Web Slinger shirt. I might as well have been wearing this shirt 
And feeling, because that's how stupid I felt when that horse beat me at 22 to one. That is one of my, that is something I say all the time. If you are playing a sequence, if you have a good friend who has a horse in, do not leave the horse off. Doesn't matter if the horse is 20 to one, 50 to one, hundred to one. It's because it's, oh, it always ends up being that horse, right? Yep. <laughs> right. Yeah. Learn exactly. my lesson. Yep. Exactly. Um, well, I mean, just to show you how much confidence we had, we left the day before. Right. So we, we, had, you know, we were like, uh, you know, we're here for the Derby and for the o- we're for the Oaks. We're not going to stay for the Derby. The crowd's going to be too big. And, and we're 20 to one. So we're, we're out of here. So that's the reason why I was calling Ren and not yelling to Ren, you know, to, yeah. to come down to the winner's circle. At, at that's that a John point, so. move, though. That's a that's a John move. Where he's like never there in Saratoga when his horses win. He texts me like, well, we're in the winner's circle. I'm like, I'm in the middle of something. Maybe he's just, bad luck. Yeah, no, so no he's question. gone. There's, no, I'm there's no question. Races, <laughs> sales, podcasts. Uh, green is bad luck. I'm like the bad penny. There's no question <laughs> no. about that. <laughs> and well. thanks, friend. That's all the time we have. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, I, well, that's actually an interesting segue because you said you were there on Oaks Day. You weren't there on Derby Day. Why were you there on Oaks Day, John? Well, we were there on Oaks Day because, you know, we, we were excited about the fact that uh, Wonder Wheel was uh, going to step up and, 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 you know, do well and, and win a, another great one and uh, just add to, you know, because it was assumed, hey, she's champion. She's Eclipse winner. You know, of course, of course, she's going to win another great one. Um, wah, wah. Unfortunately, she she did not. But that's why we were up at, at in Canada, uh, you know, last week was watching her run. Um, that's where Mark has the majority of his horses up in, up in Woodbine. And we thought it would just be a natural for her to go up to Woodbine and, and train on that turf, uh, excuse me, on that, on that course, hopefully try the turf later on, um, and, and give her kind of an easier race. And unfortunately, you know, Wonder Wheel, as smart as she is, she had other plans and, uh, I think she's ready. And, and again, we can talk about this a little bit, but sometimes when these great fillies get a little time off, they come back and, and racing is not first and foremost on their mind, unfortunately. Um, but it, it, it's, you know, she has a little bone bruising and she has, um, you know, a little bit of an ankle. It was the original ankle that we did the, the ankle surgery on. And, and dad and I just thought, you know what, we can do surgery again on her ankle and give her a little bit of time. And by the time she comes back, it'll be October, November, and we'll have to make the decision about what to do with her um, at that point. So we decided to go ahead and, and, you know, she owes us nothing. You know, she, she, she won two grade ones for us and, and was champion. Um, and that's why we decided to go ahead and, and pull the plug on her racing career and give her some time. And, uh, it, we will announce for the very first time that, uh, she is actually going to be entered into the night of the stars, the phasic tip, the night of the stars sale. Um, that'll be, uh, the, fir- I th- believe the first weekend of November, but she will be, uh, heading down to Kentucky, down to Taylor made. Um, this week, and uh, hopefully starting her next career as uh, as a phenomenal blue hen broodmare. So that way, Ren Crothers can say, "Hey, remember that family? Uh, we're we're going to say it's it's one G for green. You know, one G where uh, you know that that's where Wonder Wheel came from. I can tell uh, you what family it is if you want me to look. You please, please, I will, I, I absolutely. I will look it up right now. Um, but yeah, Joe, that, that's, that's what we're, that's what we're doing. Uh, we're going to, you know, we're going to give her the time off. She ran nine times for us, had, had four wins, including two grade ones and, uh, and a championship. And, and probably most importantly for me, um, it was the, uh, it was the last time that, uh, my mom actually traveled with us, uh, when we went out to Kentucky to, to watch her run, uh, watch Wonder Wheel run in the Oaks. And, uh, I will always hold it near and dear to my heart the the night that uh, wonder wheel won the eclipse um and my mom actually elbowed all of us out of the way to get to the trophy <laughs> first um even though she wasn't feeling well and, and was battling cancer she just pushed everyone out of the way to make sure that she can get on that stage and uh that was actually one of the things i talked about at, at her memorial service was just how happy she was that night when wonder wheel who's a affiliate that she named um right. wonder wheel uh you know won the eclipse and uh, you know i'll always hold that uh, near and dear to my heart yeah Queen Bee, the Queen Bee of the Green family. And, uh, you know, we've, we've expressed our condolences before, but I want to echo that once more, John, because Lois was a wonderful woman. And, and I love I loved that she named that horse because, I mean, that, that was like the, the perfect send off to have Wonder Wheel be that successful. Um, but obviously well bred as well and is going to fetch a lot of money, I think, at, at a, you know, at the Night of the Stars is just wild. Ren, have you ever covered? That, that sale? I've been there. I love that sale. That sale is amazing. Family 12B, by the way. 12, okay. 12B. Okay. 12B. You. You gotta, 
Explain um, this to me. What okay, are these numbers? So, so they're there. It, it would be I was long. Gonna say explain to the audience, but me first. And then, uh, you know, the audience probably already knows <laughs> no, well, because right now we only have an audience of two and that's <laughs> me and you. So, so she's, you're doing both. You're accomplishing uh, well, both. I mean, okay. So basically the long of the, and the short of it is, is that, um, there was a theory that was proffered um, a while back about family numbers for the thoroughbreds. And there, there's some debate about it now because we can better trace the mitochondrial DNA and all of this. I don't know. This could get long involved. But basically, the, the, the original thought was if we can track how many stakes winners are from this line, how many stakes winners are from this line, and then we assign numbers to those families, then we can have an idea of how classy they are, what they tend to produce, etc., that's the very like stripped down version of it all. And so for me, one of my favorite families is family one X. The reason being is we keep seeing these horses turn up time and time again. This is the family of La Troyenne. La Troyenne from her progeny, we get the likes of like Buck Pass or uh, just tons of I mean, easy goers part of this family, glowing tribute, sea hero. You see the statue there at Saratoga. Uh, it, it's a uh, mine shaft is part of, I mean, it just goes on and on. It's, it's, it's an incredible family. And um, one of the other things that I just saw was so striking regarding it is that if you look at the past Breeders' Cup juveniles, um, our last year's winner Forte is part of Family 1X. Uh, Essential Quality is part of Family 1X. Uh, Corniche is part of Family 1X. Uh, Game Winner is part of Family 1X. I mean, just look at it there in that short span of time and you see just how consistently it shows up. So that's why I am always like, oh, wow, Family 1X. That's why, for example, I think it's HIP 73 at the Phasic Tipton sale, that volatile. I was just going to ask you if there's anything in the Phasic sale that, okay. Yep. Yes. So there are a couple. There aren't very many 1Xs, but, uh, and that this colt looks like a sprinter. Uh, but that being all said, he, he's, to me, I just love the thought of what if when you have that type of back class, that type of black type bolstering uh, your pedigree, so to speak, that you're hoping the genetic gold is there to tap into. So um, yeah, I, I just find it fascinating. I love breeding theory. I love when you see horses kind of bred back to the same families, um, et cetera, et cetera. I, it, it, it gets like, again, really long and involved, but there's a whole theory to it. And, and Ren, just put the you're talking about geek about under Ren the whole time she's talking, just put pet geek right at yeah. the bottom. <laughs> No, I mean I love it. No, I love it because it really is a fascinating segment of the of the breed of the racing world, and I always love having an expert on because I think we can all learn more. Always, go ahead, John. No, I was going to say the the, the the cult that she was talking about, Hip Seventy Three, is a volatile cult um, out of a more than ready mare, and uh, obviously volatile. This is his first crop of of yearlings to be sold, but it it does link back immediately to the third and fourth dam to run up the colors and up the flagpole, which is, uh, you know, such a famous, famous family, yeah. um, you know, and, and such a flagship family, as you mentioned, Ren, there was, I, I know we're kind of circling back, but there was no, another okay. one that I wanted to talk to you about. It was, a, it was a broken vow, uh, cult. Or yes. Was it a broken vow Philly? What was, what was that, uh. I know you and I were talking off it was air hip, about it. Was hip? Um, I'll tell you right now. It was it hip, hip number. Uh, nope. do, 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 do. Hip number two forty nine. Oh, yeah, two forty nine. So, Joe, you, you talk about like inbreeding and and how close you should you know breed to certain horses. So there's a broken. Can I talk about that? Or it feels like you're talking about it. Well, I'm I'm trying to bring you in as as a good okay, co-host. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. And, and make you sound closure. smart. Since, yep. since you only say that I only give back into compliments. I'm, I'm, so, Joe, nice, remember, nice. remember when we were talking about, when we were having that, that discussion about phenotypes and genotypes the other day? Remember <laughs> over, yep. over, over at Ice Tape? Um, mm -hmm. Well, this all, this all goes back to what you were saying before about how close can you breed horses. And there's a broken vow who is an unbridled out of wedding vow. And in the third dam of this filly is wedding vow. So you're talking about two by three. To wedding vow to to a to, you know to to a, a, a grand old mayor and and Ren, what do you think about that? Since you have such a um, experience in in genetics, what you know is that too close? I mean, it, no, it's not. No, it's not too close. But I, I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get that same type either. I mean, when you when you're breeding, I mean, that's the hope that you you try to recreate something that's already worked and that you reinforce certain genetics. There's something called hybrid vigor, which I think actually works really well, where you're breeding a horse to a completely separate, like no matching ancestors, you know, no matching ancestors. Um, and so it just creates what they call hybrid 
vigor uh, in, in trying to respark something. And so I, that's part of what I also love about seeing all the Europeans um, coming, you, you know, hopefully mixing things up. Uh, we've talked about horses staying here when they come to race sometimes. I, it's, it's also part of why I feel if you look at the dynasty that we've seen with Sunday Silence, right? That's part of the excitement when you see now a, a Sunday Silence Sire line, like uh, a new Sire Yoshida, right? So we're getting some of this mix up uh, coming back in. Although I will say one of the things that people tend to forget, and this is actually one of my favorite facts regarding pedigrees and just how potent America can be. If you look at some of our top stallions historically, if you look at Halo, if you look at Northern Dancer, and if you look at Arctic Turn, who was a champion sire in France, all three of them are out of uh, half sisters. So Halo's out of Cosma. Uh, uh, Northern Dancers out of Natalma. And um, the, oh my gosh, Arctic Turn, I got to remind myself. I don't um, remember Arctic Turn, but yeah, they're, they're all out of the, the same, you know, they're all from the same female family. Well, well they, they are because the, their grandma, their grandma in, in all three is uh, Alma Mood. So right. she produced these three daughters and then these three daughters produced those three stallions, which is insane, right? When you think about it. Um, and, and, I, I just and just love the that influence stuff. that they've had in the entire industry. Exactly. I mean, you talk about, about Halo Northern Dancer and Arctic Turn, not only here in the States, but worldwide um, recognizable. But, it, but Ren, don't you think that, that when you get horses that are that in that closely in Bubbling inbred, beauty, that's it. Bubbling <laughs> beauty. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> like, like this one is, you know, two by three. To a to 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 a genetic. I mean, I mean, I mean the only if the horse isn't fast. I've heard of crazier. The, I have heard of crazier. Really? Not 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 that not that has been done any time recently. But I have okay. heard of like things that you're like, no, dude, no. <laughs> Yeah, because if this, if this filly can't run, she could at least be part of the royal family. She's that closely inbred. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, here's here's an example of something that I, I find that I like. Uh, we'll talk about hip uh, 22, for example. So there you have a War of Will Colt. That's the, and he hails from the his mother is from the family of Cavorting and Clarier. And, but it's also the extended family of Lafarge. And if you remember, Lafar is a by northern dancer. So I like the breeding back to a northern line stallion, which War of Will is through Warfront, through Danzig, through, you know, to Northern Dancer. So I think that's like, I like that type of breeding a lot. And I love the fact that that female family has Medallia, Dioro and Pleasant Colony, which should add leg um, to the Danzig and Northern Dancer <laughs> side. So you're, you're hoping that you're going to, you know, breed in some leg. Um, so that way you don't just get like a, a, a short legged, powerful hmm. looking horse. I'll say this briefly. I have not seen these horses in person, so I can't tell you what they look like. This is all just based on page. But to me, the three horses that if I had money to just go, hey, buy them <laughs> would be 73, 122, which is an Omaha Beach Philly. And that one, uh, it, it's the family of uh, Epitome, who won the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies, Essence of Dubai, and then a Green Forest, who is a champion in France. Uh, Hip 149, another Omaha Beach out of a Giants Causeway mare named Pipistrella, the second dams by Galileo. And she is a three-quarter sister to High Chaparral. So I love that. I love that. It's also the family Shanna Star. So if I could buy horses, I, those three would really catch my attention uh, big time. But, you know, <laughs> we could talk all day on that. Your show's only, we can't do two hours, John. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you guys can do as much as you want. I'm chilling. This is but that, this That's, is, a, that's this a Rail little... Talk exclusive. A Rail mm -hmm. Talk exclusive. Ren Carruthers giving her top three pedigrees. Short list. In the sale. And as a broodmare right. prospect, I mean, I know she's only a yearling. I told you this, John. I would, I, I, I would be looking at maybe. Um, uh, well, there's two. The 309 because uh, she's out of a blame mare. So actually, that would be more of a race. She's by Oscar Performance out of a blame mare because Blame's turning out to be just this tremendous broodmare sire. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's been a good sire for sure, but like the broodmare sire, you, you keep seeing that hit. And the, I mean, that's the family of Kafefe and Althea and all that Archicoma. Love that. And then as a broodmare prospect going forward, 354, that's a Bernardini filly out of an awesome again mare. And then the granny is a grade two winner named Tiz Dubai, who's a full sister to Tiz now. So that's a mare. If she's, if she's, you know, if she looks to type, I would like as a broodmare to like maybe finally, that's the type of mare that I feel like you get in your barn in the hopes of breeding a derby winner because you're going to get so much classic stamina from that horse. And Bernardini himself has been a tremendous broodmare sire. So the fact that he is her sire, 
That's right. the way I look at it. But I don't right. have the money. <laughs> I might know a guy. I might you know might. a guy. You know, you know uh, a guy. You no, know. I mean, go ahead, John. No, I was gonna. I was gonna say. So, so those are the ones that kind of pique your interest, and then the July sale starts to roll into the the Saratoga August sale. Yeah. Um, are you finding that pedigrees? I mean, obviously the pedigrees from a commercial standpoint are better. Are they stronger also in in that from a genetic standpoint? Well, I don't. I, I mean, I I think that obviously you're the you're you're hoping to get in these real select sales. The summer sale there at Saratoga is a big party, right? For the yearlings, and I mean that's where, for example, flight line sold. Uh, I believe Natalma herself went through the ring there at the Phasic yep. Tipton Yearling. So it, 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 it's 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 hard because you're going to get good horses from both. I think a lot of people love the idea of being part of that Saratoga sale, but I mean, and then you have Keeneland in September. It's it, it's just for me. Uh, I, I don't know. I feel like a kid in a candy store. I can only look at the candy, but I still get excited to look at it. <laughs> Tis the season, tis the season. And, and you know, we're, we're, we're only going to get more and more into the yearling sales as the season goes on. But it kicks off, like I said, on Tuesday at the Face of Tip in July sale. And hello, beautiful sponsorship, Ship Synergy. Taylor Made has 44 yearlings in next week's Face of July sale, including several yearlings by exciting first crop sires that you guys mentioned before, like yeah. Authentic, Improbable, Vacoma, Tis the Law. And I wanted to mention this major catalog upgrade. It's Hip 110, a great oh, colt by Malibu Moon, first foal out of an unraced half sister <gasps> oh, to Belmont winner. Archangelo, yep. great, great young fam family to buy into right now. You can go see him on, at Barn 2 on the Facing Sales grounds. Uh, John, and if you want to jump in, Ren, as well, but as a breeder, like how big of a deal is it for this, for kind of like unproven female family to get that kind of upgrade and update to the pedigree? Well, that like, actually is a tremendous ahead, family. Yeah, that Ren, one. Oh, sorry. That, that no. family is insane, actually. That's yeah. better than Honor, Best in Show. And in fact, it's funny because if you looked at the Belmont field and you, and you just based it on pedigree alone, there was no horse who was more deserving of being the heir to the Belmont winner circle that day than Archangelo because that's the fil that family produced Jazzle and his sister Rags to Riches, both Belmont winners. So it was almost like it was absolutely meant to be. And can I tell you one of the my favorite photos I've seen coming out of racing period since that race is the one with Jenna and Archangelo at the barn because you can see how uh, sincerely that horse loves her. Yep. No, it was a beautiful scene all together. I remember I was in the West Point box and Jenna walked past us to go down oh. the horseman stairway to the winter circle. Standing O. Standing ovation yeah. from everybody, including the oh. connections of people who had opposing horses that's in the awesome. Belmont. You no, don't nor awesome. normally get results like that, that everybody is happy for. That was definitely one of them. And it's a, it's an interesting family. And it's interesting, like you say, Ren, that the, the family is was so well bred for that kind of classic success. But the horse cost thirty five thousand dollars as a yearling. So yeah. you never know. You can find these horses that fall through the cracks and then they end up turning into into horses like Archangelo. Arch 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 in the Belmont. Well, I wonder if part of it is too, you know, there, people are genu genuinely, they're looking for the perfect specimen a lot of the times when it's not right. always attainable. And some of the things that people will pass a horse up for, whether it's like a minor OCD or some other minor flake, you know, whatever, sometimes they'll pass on these horses that are really well met. You just need to give them a little time. In this case, he looks like a big horse. Maybe they felt he wasn't going to be precocious. They want to get the return on investment quick. Um, and I, I just think that when you look at a, a, that pedigree, though, like I said, it, it's just so meant for a mile and a half. Just throw it at him because here you got Arrogate there who, I mean, tr that Travers performance was incredible at the mile and a quarter. The, the second da or the dam is by Tappet, who has sired how many Belmont winners? Four. And now mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, right. It's four. Um, yep. And then, like I said, then you have two Belmont winners right there. <laughs> That the female family itself is produced, so it's sort of like, "Hey, everybody, I'm right here." Um, <laughs> yep. I, will I mean, you, you look you look back at it now, and you go, "Like, duh, of course it was right there." Like, it, listen, it, that so was my obvious. only good opinion of the day. That was my only good opinion of the day. So I'm standing by that one. I will say, I thought Forte ran tremendous, considering mm -hmm. that he had all that time off. Uh, since the Florida Derby, because he couldn't run in the Derby itself. And then they, because of that, they, they were forced to skip the Preakness. Um, I think the Jim Dandy's next for that horse, which is pretty exciting. Yeah. Not to, di yeah. not to digress, but 
No, I mean, and just the other thing I would say about that or about Arch- Archangelo costing $35,000 as a yearling, people, I think, got off of Arrogate way, That's- way, 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 way too soon exactly. where You're he exactly had, right. had this explosive sales success. His first handful of foals weren't that great on the track. And then everybody jumped off the bandwagon. And then all of a sudden he gets multiple grade one winners. Now he has a classic winner as well. And then he gets well. geek. I mean. Yes. <laughs> the, 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 the truest and most important <laughs> endorsement um, in all of racing. <laughs> Oh, you know what? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, you go. I was just going to tell you because I pulled this up just so I so I can speak to knowledge. I'm not going to read the whole thing because the show would be this is going back to your family numbers just so I I can clarify in a more specific way. And this is from TBHeritage.com so I can give them credit. Uh, The family numbers commonly used to designate the various thoroughbred female families were popularized by Bruce Lowe. He was an Australian pedigree researcher and this was at the end of the 19th century. And his work, Breeding Horses by the Figure System, was published posthumously in 1895. And so I'm just going to go back. It's basically it's by identifying the family with the most classic winners, the one descending from Trigon Wells natural barb mare was designated family number one. And it just goes on. And there's just these theories regarding the female strains and what they produce. And uh, for example, families one through one through 50, Bruce Lowe's original numbered English families with with uh, additions traceable to the earliest volumes in this general stud book. But again, there are people who do the genetic sides of it, the actual uh, you know, looking at the DNA. And so there, there are some parts where maybe the, we don't know exactly there was maybe a mistake in the ledger. So to sp- I don't know. Right. Um, I'm not going to speak to them because that's not my forte. My <laughs> forte is just looking at pedigrees and for myself, yep. seeing how they fit. And I use them more for myself in handicapping period. And, and Joe, I got to give Ren credit because two years ago when we sat down and, and I said, Ren, all right, if you want to, you want to name a horse Pedigeek, I, you know, we reserved it. Do you want it to go to this candy ride, to this arrogate, to this? And she goes, not the arrogate. And I was like, wait, I'm not done yet. There's still like two others. She goes, not the arrogate. I want to, I want to name the arrogate. I love the family. It's from, it's from family XYZ 32. And it goes back to the blah, blah, blah. And, blah, blah. and it's I like for that? the next five minutes, I just put the phone down. Cause she was like, bah, 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 bah. And I was like, please, for the love of God, just stop talking. I'll name the horse. Petty geek, I swear. Here, I thought but, it was just because she was gray, or not gray, but like sort of has that hint of it. I thought she might turn gray. Uh, no, but you know wait, what? Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. I just I have to butt in here, John. Why the hell have I never gotten to name a horse? I've talked to you a lot longer than Ren has, <laughs> and I still have not been able to name a horse. Don't because tell me I like Ren because Ren, Ren's a lot a lot easier to talk to, <laughs> and, and she lets me talk for two hours. Hey guys. <laughs> oh, he's got All the right, walk-off. that's the end of show half. Show half. <laughs> they, he's got the walk-off. <laughs> Man, drop the mic. They're going to have so much fun editing this. <laughs> no, it's great. No, that's why, that's why we pay them the medium bucks. <laughs> that was great, um, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> the medium bucks. <laughs> Wait, I'm sorry. We've got one more topic the we want to get to. The size bucks. Oh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So we we're not going to get... Oh, okay. I was just going to say, so we're not giving actual like selections or like our top threes in those Belmont Derby and the Belmont Oaks. No, I mean, maybe at no some worries. point we'll start because doing that. Because then I that, can't but... be wrong. Then I can't yeah. be wrong. <laughs> it's better that we tell everybody after the race that we after liked our intro. That's, <laughs> That's what we do. We save behind. Exactly. The, yeah, we save. Yeah, Let's, we save we'll this. We say, I know what we do. We say every horse's name. I like this horse. I like this horse. Well, da, 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 da. We do this behind the scenes. And then, and then you guys release later. Oh, look, we were having this conversation off camera. Yeah, and, <laughs> right, and Ren picked. Bang. You know, Ren, it's funny. The reason why I'm into the horse business in the first place, this is the truth. So yeah. My, my mom's uncle um, was like the mayor of Asbury Park at one point, and he used to bring people oh. to Monmouth Park on the on the weekends to you know to, to show them a good time. And so when when I started getting into racing when I was like a little kid, he would still bring you know clients and stuff to the to the to Monmouth Park. And no matter what the weather was, Uncle Marty would always have a three piece suit. He'd oh, always wow. be very <laughs> dapper and have the vest and have the pocket watch. And oh, and it gets and, so hot. Yeah. Oh my God. And every single time I saw him. The race would be run, and he would go, hey, John, go cash this for me. And he would give me a win ticket every oh. single race. And it wasn't until after he passed away that my mom told me the secret. He bet $5 on every horse in the race, so that way he could say, look. And he knew it by pockets. Like his left pocket was one, his right front pocket was two. And the only problem was when there was a 12-horse field, he had to wear a hat. So that way he could, he could fit. But I swear to God, the son of a gun won every single time. And it took me years to figure out how it was. So we can just do the same thing here. We can just. That's hilarious. You know, like, I think we should just say every horse. And then you guys cut to the, the actual. Right. 
Yep. Yeah. Just read the names. Just say yeah, Mission exactly. of Joy. Strikingly spun. You know. Yeah. Oh my we'll do the gosh. thing that they do for like yeah for like Madden, where the announcers have to read every <laughs> single name in the oh. NFL. So they eventually. Are you use serious? Them, so they have to do that. Yeah. I yep. think so. Yeah. yeah. Oh my it. gosh! No yeah, way. Know, AI or something. Just an uh, editing note. Next time John starts telling family stories, do I start playing him off with music or no? no I mean, <laughs> I mean, who is that? That was a good one. Yeah. In general, I would say yes. Rule of thumb, yes. <laughs> but that was okay. Let, let give him like 10, 15 seconds, and then start winding up the music, oh, yeah, and then you can bring it down. Is there a hook? Like, can your wife come in there and pretend to hook right, you like, up? Like the like the Eclipse Awards, right? After thirty seconds, they start. <gasps> oh, the, band. the desiccant. The desiccant. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you guys know that reference. <laughs> I heard Our audience that, that they're actually Sorry. they're uh, they're they're uh, limiting the Hall of Fame speeches in the NFL to six minutes this year, oh, wow. which is the first time they're ever doing that. Of course, the first year the two Jets get in. I'm not going to uh, elude any conspiracy. However, they, we we need like six seconds for the Eclipse Award. So because then the speeches that are usually like five minutes will get cut down to like two, two and a half. That was right. one of the things I loved about the COVID year is everybody had to be tight. And that was when we won. That was when right. Patty and I won. And we gave them like a we gave them like a 45 second clip and they got back to us. and They were like way too long, way, way too long. Did you notice the humble brag? Back, back when I won, when I won the eclipse, won the the eclipse. COVID year. Well. you should just hold up the sign to say thank you, and then <laughs> it's done. Thanks, thank you. All right, we were going to talk about the highs and stuff, but I don't know. I, I, I think we're is, out of time. We're out of time. This is this was bound to happen with the three of us. Uh, we'll tease it for next week. Next week, there learn you what go. we think about all of the the highs of suspensions. There'll be plenty of time to talk all about all that. But Ren, how much fun was this? Thank you so much for being our first guest. We loved it. Are you kidding? This is so much fun for me. I love horse racing. I've always loved it. I grew up on a thoroughbred horse farm. Uh, this has just been something I've lived and breathed so, for so much of my life. To be able to share that passion with others is, I mean, how would I not take you up on the offer? And especially, again, with this being your first show, I can't tell you what an honor it is. And hopefully at some point I do get that Eclipse Award um, as opposed to the beard. <laughs> and I appreciate as the host Ren cramming in her bio there because it being the first show, I forgot to ask her, her bio up front. <laughs> I'm just me. We'll, we'll try harder next I'm just time. Me. We'll try harder. Oh my God. Just we'll for like Secretariat fan. I mean that that can be just. I should put that in my bio. Secretariat. Like oh yeah. Well, you're 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 our favorite Michigan bread for sure. <gasps> that hey, I'm probably the only Michigan bread. <laughs> <laughs> Next time we have you on, we'll get it. We'll get into your background. But Red, thank you so much for coming on, and John, thank you, thank you for coming. Thank you to Patty Wolf, our producer, and our associate editors, associate producers. I'll say our assistant producers, Anthony Laraca and Nathan Wilkinson, and Aliyah Laraca as well. We had so much fun on this first episode of Rail Talk. Thank you to Ren again. Thank you to all of you for listening and watching. We'll see you next week. All right, so that was a lot of fun. If you made it this far, first of all, you're a diehard. Thank you for watching. I love you very much. Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. I think the buttons are down here below my face right now. Uh, we want to get as many subscribers, as many comments as possible. It's comments especially because we want to bring you on the show. If you got something to say, if you have an if you have an alternative opinion, if you just want to call me and John Ugly, just come on the show. We'll have you on to do that anyway. But thank you so much for watching. Like, comment, subscribe. Now you got to do it in that order. That's why, you're, that's why you're the best. You're the best. You're the best. You're the best.